from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day, and welcome back to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for sculptors working, teaching, and studying the figurative tradition of sculpture. I'm your host, Jason Arkels, podcasting from Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today we're going to talk about one of my favorite sculptors in art history. Uh, In fact, this guy was my first favorite sculptor after I started to study art back in uh, in the 1990s. I attended the Charles H. Cecil Studio, which is an atelier renowned for its training of uh, portrait painters, so it might come as no surprise that my first real affinity for an old master's work would be for Jean-Antoine Houdon. Quite simply, Houdon was the best portrait sculptor who ever lived. Now, what makes Houdon the best? Well, apart from the uh, prerequisite accomplishments of expanding the genre into new untapped potentials and, and of technical virtuosity, for me, It's Houdin's unprecedented ability to strip his subjects of all extraneous elements, power, class, gender, even such accidentals as the time and place into which a person is born. He strips all of this away, I think, to reveal the truest humanity of a subject rendered in marble that I've ever experienced. I mean, after having seen a portrait by Houdin when he's at his best, I feel as though I've met that subject of the portrait, you know, met the person themselves. No other portrait artist has that power over my perception and subconsciousness like Houdin does. Houdin's work remains a source of inspiration that I return to again and again. His work is a yardstick by which I measure how far I still have to go in my own work. So, imagine my surprise when I learned that this master, who might arguably be the godfather of naturalistic technique in sculpture, was entirely a product of the Rococo. Houdin was a Rococo sculptor, practically born into the French academic training system under the old regime, as we shall see. But how is this possible? Because the Rococo is is pleasantries and stale conventions, it's decorations, it's, uh, I mean, it's everything that's sort of antithetical to the unvarnished truths which imbue Houdin's work. And yet there it is, the most acclaimed sculptor of all the Rococo period, was the sculptor who managed to break free from its conventions. Houdin was born in 1741 into a lower middle-class background. His, his father was a concierge for a villa, which was owned by a nobleman, and this villa was in the village of Versailles, the village just outside Paris where King Louis XIV had built his enormous palace to which he eventually moved his court back in the century previous. Now, the year that Houdin was born, 1741, Louis XIV's successor, Louis XV, had already been ruling for a quarter century of his eventual 59-year reign. And when Houdin was just eight years old, something occurred that would have a profound influence on his youth. The villa where his father worked as a concierge was incorporated into the Académie Royale and became a small school known as the École des Élèves Protégés, or the School for Protégé Students. And this was a new addition to the academy system. It was a three-year program which the winners of the Prix de Rome, you know, the Prix de Rome, the coveted top prize, awarded only to the best painters and sculptors of the Academy Royale, they now had to attend this new three-year program. It seems that the level of artistry and competence of the Prix de Rome winners had kind of fallen off a bit in recent years. And in addition, uh, the work that was coming back from Rome Uh, from the Prix de Rome winners was a bit too heavily influenced by more contemporary Roman artists, and not by the classical statuary there, which, of course, that was the whole reason the students were sent to Rome, right? To learn proper and official taste, which could only be taught by the classics. So the École des Élèves Protégés was sort of a, a grad school, where the winners of the Prix de Rome were expected to train for three additional years in the official style, as well as learn advanced techniques uh, in painting and sculpture, such as marble carving and advanced composition. And they were also taught Italian. So it really was a good prep school 
the pre to Rome winners just wouldn't waste a whole lot of time once they got to Rome. They could get right down to business. They would already know Italian. They would know how to carve marble. They would be very explicitly instructed as to what direction their work really needed to take, according to the French academic system. So anyway, imagine being eight-year-old Jean-Antoine Houdon, and now the big house where you lived was now full of young and talented pre to Rome winners, all dreaming of their eventual journey to the Eternal City. It's little wonder that little Jean-Antoine enrolled at the earliest possible opportunity into the Academy Royale at the age of 13. And at the age of 20, he himself won the Prix de Rome, which meant three years of living back in his boyhood home, the villa turned grad school. Now, we don't have any work that survived from Houdon's student days. The earliest stuff we have from Houdon's hand are works that he completed while in Rome, studying at the French Academy in Rome. And while still a student, his talents were recognized to the point of being granted a few commissions for the church of Santa Maria degli Angeli in Rome. And uh, these works were a St. John the Baptist and a St. Bruno. Now, the John the Baptist was never carved into marble, and the plaster has been destroyed. But something survives from that commission, which has become one of Houdon's most recognizable works. At least, it should be recognizable to us sculptors. It seems that with his first life-size work, Houdon really wanted to make sure that he got the figure looking as correct as possible. So, he first made the John the Baptist as an écorché study, and he did it life-size. Now, for those unfamiliar with the term écorché, it means flayed or, or skinned in French, and it is the name that artists give to anatomical studies of figures or, or parts of figures without skin or fat, you know, that reveal the muscles and the bones which comprise the structure of the human figure. It's an excellent way to study anatomy, and it's not the worst way in one might compose a figure as well, if, if one really knows their anatomy. Lots of examples for historical écorchés exist, and are sold, commonly, as study guides for sculpture studios and classrooms. And Houdon's has become a classic. He made it commercially available in many sizes during his career, and it became one of many sources of revenue which he, uh, he drummed up. He was a, a pretty financially savvy guy, and he earned a comfortable living all of his life. So if you're wondering which of the écorchés that you might be familiar with is Houdon's, it's the one that's uh, sort of stepping forward with an outstretched right arm and an open mouth. It's kind of basically the most zombie-like of all the common écorchés. I mean, it looks like he could be saying, brains. And this écorché shows not only that Houdon knew his stuff anatomically, but also that Houdon would avail himself of whatever aids and methods he thought were necessary to do his job the best way possible. Now, most of us would consider making a life-sized écorché figure as a preparation for another work a bit overkill, but not, not for Houdon. Houdon would do whatever was necessary, even if it meant taking a plaster cast right off the, the face of a head of state, if necessary. So, the young and talented Houdon returns to Paris at the age of 27 in 1768. 1768 was also the year in which Johann Vanquelman died on a trip from Rome where he had been living. There's no reason to suppose that these two ever met while they lived in Rome, but there's no reason to suppose they hadn't either. But Houdon most certainly would have been aware of the brilliant art historian's advances in thinking about Greek and Roman work, which I covered in the last podcast. Now, these new ideas were just beginning to change the way sculptors and painters utilized references to the antique in their work. But the Paris that Houdon returned to in 1768 was still very much in the throes of the French Baroque and Rococo fashions. Houdon wanted nothing more than to find success within the framework organized and perpetuated by the academy system once he returned to Paris. He wasn't intentionally any sort of rebel or upstart. He wasn't inflamed with a new passion for Vankelman's work and desired to create a new way of making sculpture. One might say that he wasn't necessarily born for greatness, but as Shakespeare said, some have it thrust upon them. So once back in Paris, Houdon applies to the Academy Royale for the status of a gray, which uh, is kind of like being an associate member of the Academy Royale. Now this was an important step, because back under the old regime, the Paris Salon was an art exhibition 
open only to Academy members. It wasn't open to all artists like it was later on in the 19th century. So Udon applies for a gray status, and he's accepted, and he submits some work for the Salon, which consists of a bunch of his Roman work, and those are accepted, and the process of becoming a sculptor of the court of Louis XV has begun. Slight problem, though. There's not a whole lot happening in Paris for sculptors at the time. At least, there were many more sculptors than there was work available. The academic system was great at producing artists one after the other that could all do the same sort of stuff, but the need for large monuments or royal tombs, it didn't increase accordingly. Many sculptors had to find work in other areas of of the sculptural arts, like uh, decorative and architectural work. So it was towards portraiture that Udon turned to in order to find a way to make a living. He never set out to become one of the greatest portrait sculptors, and during his life, he often said that he was most proud of the figure work that he had done. But portraiture quickly became his means to not only financial security, but also to lasting fame. His first big break came in 1771, just a few years after coming back from Rome, when he somehow met Denis Diderot and convinced him to sit for a portrait bust. Now, Diderot was one of the most famous men in Paris at the time, and a darling of the Enlightenment. He was a philosoph, a man of letters, a philosopher, a famous wit, and most famously, the editor of the Encyclopedia. Now, I say the Encyclopedia, but Diderot's wasn't the first, although it was one of the most famous. The subtitle of Diderot's Encyclopedia is The Systematic Dictionary of the Arts, Sciences, and Crafts. Now, it's notable for it having had its articles written by many authors, which was kind of a new idea, uh, and also notable for its containing a very strong strain of Enlightenment thinking and philosophy and other advances. Diderot himself stated that the goal of this encyclopedia was to change the way people think. He had been its editor for 20 years when the young Udon asked him if he would sit for a portrait. Now, the deal was that Udon would sculpt his bust, and then give Diderot a free copy of it. Udon was banking on the probability that others would be willing to pay Udon for copies of the bust. It's an old trick, one still in use by portrait sculptors today. Anyway, Diderot said yes. Now, Diderot had had many portraits done of him in paint and in sculpture, and he apparently enjoyed sitting for them, and he especially admired Udon's. And indeed, Udon found commercial success in selling versions of it and exhibited a copy of it, in the 1771 Salon. But the portrait of Diderot, it wasn't just a good likeness. There, in this portrait, we see the beginnings of a new direction for Udon's work and for the art of three-dimensional portraiture. It's a deceptively simple portrait, a simple truncation right at the collar line, which Udon knew was the, the typical way the portrait of a Roman man of letters would be presented. His head was turned to one side, his lips slightly parted as a nod to Bernini's idea of the speaking likeness. But more notably, the portrait of Diderot doesn't show Diderot wearing a wig. This, of course, was the 18th century, right? People wore those horrible powdered wigs, which were called perukes. Diderot hated perukes. And when social situations demanded he wear one, uh, he always made a point of wearing them incorrectly. So Diderot's portrait is bareheaded, which would have had the effect in those days of seeming particularly informal and and maybe even perhaps a bit intimate. And enhancing this intimacy is the rendering of Diderot's eyes. Houdon makes a point of having the eyes look off to one side instead of being posed more or less in the direction of the viewer of the sculpture, which was much more common. This has the effect of giving the portrait kind of an air of contemplation, which leads the viewer into contemplating what Diderot is contemplating, a sculpture of a man that makes one ask, what is he thinking about, rather than just a mere statement of likeness. Now, if we want to go deeper, we can draw a corollary between Udon's rendering of a portrait that places emphasis on inner psychology of the subject and Johann Winkelmann's ideas of the true goals of classic Greek art. Remember, in Winkelmann's view, the Greek physical ideal is merely the manifestation of inner greatness and nobility and splendor and spirit and soul. So a Greek sculpture is the vehicle by which we look past the realm of the physical and into the metaphysical. So too, Udon's very simple portrait 
may be said to encourage the viewer to seek the true Diderot through contemplation rather than in the physical facts of likeness. I don't know, maybe that's going a bit too far. In any event, we know that this was a very good likeness, and in Diderot's own annual review of the Paris Salon, he commented positively on its fidelity to nature. One final note about Oudin's Diderot, the rendering of the eyes needs special mention here. They mark the beginning of the lifelong exploration of various ways of rendering eyes in Houdin's work. Houdin realized early on the prime importance for accurately capturing the feel of eyes, which vary greatly from person to person and from expression to expression. In the past, the rendering of eyes seldom reached the level of psychological scrutiny which Houdin consistently achieved in his work. His eyes could be... Uh, deeply undercut, or just barely incised. Some of his eyes involve several layers of incision, or even tiny circular ridges within the pupil designed to catch light just so, and give the semblance of color to the iris. The little pieces of material which interrupt the, uh, the border of an incised pupil, known commonly as glints, were meticulously rendered and done differently, but deliberately for every work each instance giving a, a slightly different effect, the effect Udon found to be the most suitable for the portrait at hand. Now, in terms of attention to the nuances of expression in the eyes of portraiture, perhaps only Bernini or Alessandro Algardi came close to the level of sophistication of Udon's. Now, even Bernini's masterpiece of intimacy, his bust of his mistress, Costanza Buonarelli, seems to have cold and dead eyes when placed side by side with many of Houdon's bust. Or you can look at um, another portrait uh, by Bernini, maybe Cardinal Borghese, which, is, which has a very lively fidelity to nature. And it's the same sort of thing. It's just everything looks great, but the eyes are just slightly hard. Now, in Houdon's work, we seem to find the earliest examples of a sculpture capturing what we today would call micro-expressions, these fleeting, momentary expressions, which are almost too subtle to be given banal names like happy or inquisitive or weary. These micro-expressions and the way that Udon renders them, they're the key to understanding the genius of Udon's portraiture. Many sculptors and sculpture fans listening will be familiar with the works I'm discussing today, but many will not. If you are not, just go to the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and in the episode gallery of this podcast, you'll find many images that are relevant to today's discussion. While you're at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, you can listen to every episode of The Sculptor's Funeral for free, and you can leave a comment or ask a question. So, Udon was off to a good start with his bust of Diderot, but it was also his debut in a new realm of patronage. Diderot was a popular public figure with many connections and friends, and one close friend was a German baron by the name of Friedrich Grimm. Now, Baron Grimm was himself a man of letters who published a uh, strange little newsletter called the Correspondence Littéraire, and it was, a, it was a private subscription sort of thing available only to a select elite who were mostly German nobility, but also included Russian nobility and royalty, including uh, Catherine the Great herself, the Empress of Russia. Now, the German and Russian courts were much more open to the ideas of the Enlightenment than the French court was at the time. In fact, their support of Enlightenment philosophies and these ideas of how to reform government is one of the things that made Catherine of Russia and Frederick of Prussia, known as Catherine the Great and Frederick the Great. Through Diderot and subsequent connections, Udon does a brisk trade both in portraits of these nobles and in portraits of such uh, luminaries of the Enlightenment, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Molière, Voltaire, the musician Gluck, and so on and so on. And Udon certainly was not limited to foreign courts. He found patrons aplenty at the French court, dozens of lords and ladies who wished to be preserved for posterity by the hand of Udon. Now, the liveliness and vitality of these portraits is really kind of the swan song of the effulgent Rococo style before it gives away in another decade or so to the more austere neoclassicism of the younger generation. 
Although I'm focusing on Udon's portraiture, he certainly received and executed larger works, including a few tombs, some allegorical figures, and other full-length figures. Some figures he took on his own initiative, such as his figure of Diana. The goddess of the hunt is portrayed fully nude, which is a tip of the hat to neoclassical ideas, but the statue has much more in common with French Baroque or, or maybe even the Fontainebleau style of mannerism than it does with the contemporary tastes of his time. It was Udon's favorite work, though, though in light of his other achievements, I kind of, I don't know, I find it a bit difficult to see why this was his favorite. Perhaps it was due to it being one of his more major works that had nothing to do with anyone else. It wasn't a portrait. It wasn't a commission. You know, the work where he had full ownership and authorship and control without having to please a client. I could understand why such a work might be his favorite, even if it's not, you know, empirically his best. Now, another full-length figure that he executed that may more fully deserve praise is his seated figure of the writer Voltaire. Many of us are familiar with Udon's Voltaire in mask form, right? It cheers up many a somber cast collection in art schools and ateliers around the world. His ancient yet boyish grin is a masterpiece of naturalistic expression and sculpture, and would serve as an inspiration to many great sculptors throughout the 19th century, including the likes of Carpeau and Deleu. Udon's full-length figure of Voltaire was modeled right before Voltaire's death. The last sitting actually occurred less than a week before Voltaire died, but his frail little body, seated on sort of a, a thronish chair and engulfed in an enormous sort of bathrobe, which served to sort of further reduce Voltaire's pitiful frame, is full of mental alertness. The body, the expression, it's a statue in defiance of old age, one that champions the man's mind as something that will live on despite the corruption of his earthly flesh. But the salvation this statue promises is not salvation of the soul through a heavenly savior, but immortality through human brilliance and intellectual endeavor. Udon's Voltaire might be defined as the statue of the Enlightenment. Now, during his first professional decade, the 1770s, Udon found as much success as any sculptor was afforded at that time and place. But the 1770s was not a time that anyone could afford to get too comfortable. Change was in the air. Louis XVI took the throne in 1774 at the age of 20, replacing his grandfather, Louis XV, who had reigned for nearly 60 years. The young Louis XVI, he wasn't his grandfather. Enlightenment thought appealed to Louis XVI greatly. And early on in his reign, he sought to implement reform, including relaxing persecution of non-Catholic faiths, and attempting to abolish serfdom. However, these policies, and others like it, were met with stiff opposition from the ruling class, and unfortunately, Louis XVI was not a strong leader. He would not become the reformer of France he would have liked, and never would he be called Louis the Great. His reformist views made him unpopular with the nobility, and his inability to enact those reforms made him unpopular with the rest of the country. However, Louis XVI became intensely interested in what was happening over in the English colonies in the New World. 1776 saw the formal break of the 13 colonies away from English rule and the start of the War of the American Revolution. Even though France was pretty broke at the time, thanks to the extravagances of the preceding monarchy of Louis XV, Louis XVI would eventually provide substantial financial aid to the American colonists, at a very heavy price indeed and it would help to plunge the government eventually into financial collapse in 1791, which was the precursor for France's very own revolution. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. Let's go back to the late 1770s after the success of Houdon's seated Voltaire. Houdon is now made a full academician, a lifetime position. He goes to join the most prestigious arts club in Paris, which is a Masonic lodge, known as the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. The Nine Sisters is a reference to the Nine Muses, and this Masonic Lodge was a place where the literati would go to rub shoulders with the greatest artists of the day. And at this club of the Nine Sisters, Houdon meets a fascinating American colonist who has come to Paris in an official capacity as an ambassador from a nation which does not yet exist. Benjamin Franklin, inventor, 
philosophe, journalist, and ladies' man, is in town to woo the French king into taking a side against their mutual enemy, the English. But in his spare time, Franklin is down at the Masonic Lodge, and Houdon sculpts his portrait. Now, like many of Houdon's heads, there are quite a few different versions of his Benjamin Franklin. One shows Franklin in his contemporary sort of Quaker-style outfit, and the other portrays him in sort of a, a Rococo classicism, draped in a toga like a Roman statesman. Both are extraordinary portraits, and they're actually my personal favorites from Houdon. And if you're an American, you know these portraits. They are from where we get most our images of Franklin, and have been the source for later etchings and engravings for stamps and currency. Basically, if you can picture Ben Franklin in your head, you're probably picturing Houdon's bust. Ben Franklin was in France from 1776 until the end of the American Revolutionary War. So in 1785, Franklin was to be replaced as ambassador to France by Thomas Jefferson, who would serve as ambassador from 1785 to 1789. Now, a few months before Jefferson's departure for France, the new United States Congress had voted to erect a marble statue of General George Washington, hero of the American Revolution. It was a task put to Jefferson when he got to France to find the best sculptor in Europe to execute this statue. Now, we can assume Ben Franklin probably recommended Houdon, but that recommendation was probably not needed because Houdon was the preeminent sculptor of France. Houdon tells Jefferson that there really isn't a better way to do the statue of Washington other than to travel to America and work up the portrait directly from life. So in July of 1785, Franklin departs Europe accompanied by Houdon. Meeting Washington at his retirement home known as Mount Vernon, Houdon sculpts and casts his portrait in a matter of days, and he leaves a plaster cast of the portrait at Mount Vernon, where it still sits today. Houdon heads up to Philadelphia before departing back to France, and he arrives back in Paris on Christmas Day of the same year. The whole trip there only took six months. The eventual portrait statue which arose out of this commission is a pretty interesting one. Although it depicts Washington in his contemporary military uniform, it has a real neoclassical feel to it. Even though it's ostensibly a portrait of a great general, the sense we get from the work is one of a visionary, a philosoph called by his people to lead a nation into battle. The victory this statue celebrates is the triumph within Washington's noble spirit, not on the battlefield. I imagine the contemplative yet contemporary nature of Houdon's Washington was a source of inspiration for Daniel Chester French, another sculptor who, over a century later, had the task of commemorating another wartime president for the Lincoln Memorial on the National Mall of Washington, D.C. One of the aspects of Houdon's work that I really appreciate is that it's really difficult to pigeonhole him as a sculptor. He seems to be, at times, given over to Rococo flourishes, and certainly his portraiture in general exhibits the best of what Rococo liveliness could be. But at the same time, and sometimes even in the same work, Udon can provide such insight and illuminate the most noble aspects of his subjects to such a degree that I, I can't really deny feeling that there must be a strong connection to Vankelman's theories as to how and why these sculptors should emulate Greek art. And at the same time, when Udon attempts to include some overtly neoclassical attributes in his work, like Grecian mantles and togas, it's unconvincing. When he tries to do it, he can't. And when he doesn't, he somehow does. In short, Udon isn't neoclassical, and he's not Baroque. He is just simply Udon. Like all true greats, he is unprecedented and unparalleled. He might not be the same sort of game-changing sculptor that Donatello or Bernini was, but considering his time and place in the history of art, he did better than anyone might have predicted. However, as I said, change was in the air, and Houdon's primacy in the field of sculpture could not last forever. We'll hear more about these changes when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hey, podcast listeners, just a quick shout out for our excellent sponsor. The Sculptor's Funeral is brought to you in part by Blick Art Supplies the oldest and largest supplier of professional art supplies in America, 
They have been in business for over a century, providing America and beyond with everything a sculptor needs and all your favorite brands. From your favorite clay modeling tools, modeling stands, armature supplies, clays, plasters, molding and casting supplies, they have it all. And the shipping in the U.S. is free on most items if the order is over $100. And best of all, ordering your supplies from Blick Art Supplies directly supports the Sculptor's Funeral podcast. Just go to the podcast website, thesculpturesfuneral.com, click on any of the Blick buttons you find on the homepage or on the episode pages, and shop away. A percentage of your purchase goes to support the show, but it doesn't cost you anything, and you will earn my deepest appreciation. So the next time you need to stock up on plastilina, armature wire, or mold rubber, remember the sculptor's funeral and click on Blink. And thanks. So Udon comes back to France in 1785 after his visit to the United States and completes his statue of Washington, along with, of course, a few different versions of Washington's bust. He also sculpts the bust of Thomas Jefferson at this time, who is the ambassador of France, living in Paris. Houdon also gets married, has three kids over the next five years, and his career is doing great. Houdon actually lands the one commission every artist in France is after, the portrait of King Louis XVI in 1787. His work for the French nobility is endless and includes the likenesses of the Marquis de Lafayette, the Conte Cagliostro, and many, many more. During the same time, the late 1780s, Houdon finds the time to to sculpt portraits of his wife and his infant children. He also attempts a few allegorical works, including a full-length Vestal Virgin, which received mixed reviews. But other than that, life is good. What could possibly go wrong in Paris in the late 1780s? Well, even with all the events leading up to the French Revolution, including the financial collapse of the government in 1789, Few people could have guessed what lay ahead for the nation of France and how much a revolution would transform the now centuries-old academic system of arts education and patronage in France. As it turns out, the Salon of the summer of 1789 was to be the last under the old regime. I mean, it's kind of crazy that the Salon of 1789 happened at all during that summer while the exhibition was underway. Some of the events which unfolded included the declaration of the National Assembly by the Third Estate, the storming of the Bastille, and the oath on the tennis courts. The painter, Jacques-Louis David, who had stunned the Paris art scene five years previously with his thesis on neoclassicism, the painting called The Oath of the Herati, also exhibited in the Salon of 1789, and he exhibited a painting commissioned by Louis XVI himself. However, David was no royalist, During the next few tumultuous years, David rose to great political power, both in the new governments formed, but also in the structure of the Académie Royale de Peinture et de Sculpture. In 1790, he presented himself to the National Assembly, calling himself the President of the Academy, a title he apparently just made up on the spot, and he effected a coup within the academic system itself, pitting himself and his followers against the hierarchic structure of the Academy. Academicians, like Houdon, were appointed lifetime members, and seniority was everything. Seniority determined who got the best commissions, who had the most clout, and so on. David, who, by the way, was not a full academician, formed his followers into a group which called themselves the Commune of Artists, demanding that the Academy be dissolved, and that the Salon be opened up to all artists. And it happened. So while the Salon of 1789 exhibited the works of 80 artists, all members of the Academy, the Salon of 1791 showed the work of 258 artists. The little printed program for the 1791 Salon proclaims this, The arts have received a great benefit. The empire of liberty is finally extended to all. She has broken their chains. Genius is no longer condemned to obscurity. Now I'm going to cover the events of the French Revolution and what it meant for artists more fully in a, in a future podcasts. But for right now, what did the events of the French Revolution mean for Udon? As an academician and established authority, Udon automatically earned the dislike of Jacques-Louis David. So not only did portrait work for the nobility of France evaporate with the, the dissolution of the monarchy, new commissions sponsored by the new government 
were largely closed to Udon. When things settled down a bit more under the rise and rule of Napoleon Bonaparte, and a new patronage system was put into place around the year 1800, the Rococo tastes of the old regime were reviled, and the new, Enlightenment-inspired trend towards neoclassicism, that was the new official taste. Udon, while avoiding arrest and the guillotine, was regulated to the status of anachronism. Meanwhile, neoclassicism had its fresh young faces in the likes of Bertolt Torvaldsen, David Danger, and of course, Canova, who was Napoleon's favorite. Udon was still able to make a living, mostly through sales of his greatest hits of the Enlightenment, you know, his busts of Diderot and Rousseau and Washington and Jefferson, uh, and he was even exhibiting regularly at the salons. And there is one late work of Udon's that I would love everyone listening to take a look at. I've got it up at the website. In 1808, Udon had the opportunity to sculpt Napoleon himself. And next to that image on the website of, uh, of Udon's uh, bust of Napoleon, I've got a, a picture of the bust of Napoleon done by Canova. Now, it's really unfair to judge one against the other, as, of course, the neoclassicism of Canova didn't require high fidelity to nature, right? The point of neoclassicism was to point to a higher ideal, which transcends the merely physical. When we look at Canova's work, we should use it, we should use the bust, to get a feeling for Napoleon's noble soul. But take a look at Houdon's, which is probably the most accurate rendering of Napoleon which survives. I would argue that Houdon's work, for all its verisimilitude, is at least equal to Canova's in its ability to capture the spirit of Napoleon, although it's done with very different means. It's the psychology, for lack of a better word, uh, the psychology of Udon's portraiture, which conveys the spirit. And when neoclassicism eventually starts to fade, generations of sculptors would be influenced by Udon's psychological approach to portraits. But despite his connections to the major figures of the Enlightenment and his attempts to incorporate the new neoclassical taste, Udon's star faded. He continued to show in the Salon up to 1814, but his health failed after that, and when Udon finally died in 1828, his estate, consisting of dozens of terracotta and plaster casts of his best works, were sold for very modest prices. It wasn't until the rise of a new trend in art, later known as Romanticism, that Udon's reputation was restored as one of the greatest portrait sculptors ever and as the best sculptor of the 18th century. Well, that's it for today's podcast. Please take a look at our image gallery at thesculptorsfuneral.com for pictures of some of Udon's best work and his most famous work. Don't forget that if you want to get the Sculptor's Funeral podcast downloaded automatically every week, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever podcast delivery device you use. And if you are already subscribed to the podcast, don't forget to rate us. Give us as many stars as you see fit on iTunes or Stitcher. And you can even review the show, write a few lines, and tell the world what you think of the podcast. And if you have ideas for how the podcast can improve, you can always reach out directly to me at thesculptorsfuneral at gmail.com or through the Facebook group page, The Sculptor's Funeral. And thanks so much once again for listening.